Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. We got a long-term superstar with us today. We got Greg Jennings. He is the original and still lead guitarist from Restless Heart. Uh, a couple of quick announcements. I want to thank our mutual friend, Michael Britt, for hooking us up. Thank you, Michael. And uh, also make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to the audio and video of the show. If you're watching us on YouTube, if you hit the uh, subscribe button and that little emoji that looks like a bell, that helps us out a lot with the as far as getting recommended from uh, YouTube. So thank you. Uh, long background on Greg. It's really interesting. Grew up in the small town of Nakoma Park, which is 20 miles east of Oklahoma City. His dad played guitar and liked to strum some Bob Wills tunes. And uh, he had an extensive collection of Chet Atkins records that Greg grew up listening to. He got a red harmony rocket. Do you still have that guitar? You know that thing got stolen. Someone broke into the house and stole that. Still, I wish I could get that back, but you know it's not worth that much. But it's just you know a big sentimental, sentimental. Yeah, part. yeah, man. Those harmonies sound great too, man. Yeah, I know. Yeah, they're they're prized possessions now. Uh, he got a red harmony rocket age nine. He started taking basic basic lessons from the Mel Bay book at his local music store. And he eventually started working with a jazz teacher who turned him on to Howard Roberts and Wes Montgomery. But of course, Greg was more interested in the Beatles and the British inv British invasion. After high school, Greg enrolled at Oklahoma state university in Stillwater, man. Do you know this place called Eskimo Joe? Oh yeah. Yeah. I've had a, a few beverages there. Yeah. That's so, f uh, man, when we got married, this is nine, 1998 we were in hawaii this is before the internet maybe the internet just started and i see this guy walking around with this really cool t-shirt and it said eskimo joe's and i said i just wrote it down and then when i came home i had to call 1-800-555-1212 did you order one i called i said yeah can you give me the is there a toll-free number of his place and i called him up and they sent me a catalog and i'm still a customer of theirs man it's so funny but they're big yeah. okc uh you know oklahoma state university people aren't they like they're big oh, absolutely. yeah it was a popular popular place there on campus oh that's cool man i'm glad to hear that uh so greg enrolled at oklahoma state university in stillwater and his dad knew of greg's love for music but he always encouraged him to get an education and a real job uh, and then dabble in music as a hobby. So uh, we have this in common. He majored in accounting, which he had no interest in, and he uh, played in a band on the weekends. Eventually, Greg moved to Nashville, and he started working there as a musician. In 1983, songwriter Tim Dubois wanted – is that Dubois? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, Tim Dubois wanted to branch out into production, and Tim and a couple of other writers had some good songs that were a little too pop for Nashville at the time – but two country for the top 40 charts. So they decided to form a band to showcase that material. He enlisted Greg and some other friends for the project. They recorded on a weekend with Tim footing the bill. Uh, Greg was not excited about giving up the possibility of a session career to go out on the road with a band, but he liked the music and Tim convinced him to give it a try. They did showcases for major record labels right away and RCA expressed the most interest. They were a powerhouse label. Alabama was on there, and also the Judds, Clint Black, and Vince Gill were on there. They called the band Restless Heart, and they immediately went on tour opening for Alabama. First gig was in front of 8,000 people, so it was really a baptism by fire. The band went on to tour with the Judds, Hank Williams Jr., Reba McIntyre, and loads of other country artists. And because of a crossover single they had called I'll Still Be Loving You, they also got to open for people like Bruce Hornsby and Glenn Fry. And they played a pop festival in Germany with Toto and performed on all the major TV shows. Man, somehow Toto and you guys just doesn't seem like a right bill. <laughs> I got to be honest with you. It wasn't. It wasn't. <laughs> yeah, we were the odd ones there. <laughs> Seemed a little bit, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Restless Heart was nominated for several awards. They played at most of the, of the big shows, the CMAs, the ACMs, the Grammys, the People's Choice, and the Golden Globes. They continued making albums and touring, and in 91, their lead singer decided to go solo. The band continued on as a four-piece, and ironically, they had one of their biggest records, When She Cries. In 92, the band parted ways with their keyboard player, but they continued going on for another two years, and they even made another RCA record. Eventually, RCA dropped the band and they stopped touring in 94. Uh, Greg decided to get back into session work. And, uh, and I appreciate you writing this, man, because this is really candid and honest. And he spent most of 1995 waiting for the phone to ring, but it rarely did. Uh, in 96, however, the phone rang with a big 
a, a big ring and it was Vince Gill asking Greg if he wanted to join his band and go on tour with them. Greg was obviously flattered and uh, he also felt humbled because he went uh, from being a big artist to what he felt was being the least competent member technically of the band because obviously Vince Gill everybody's in there as a monster player. Uh, and we'll talk about that. Uh, in 98, Restless Hearts lead singer called and said there was some interest in the band getting back together. Four of them got together. They hired another keyboard player and spent that year out on the road actually opening for Vince, but that was just one year. Uh, then in 2000, their old booking agent called and said there was again some interest in Restless Heart, but it would have to be all five original members. As it turned out, the uh, bass player had kept in touch with the original keyboard player. They all got together and decided to move forward. Uh, they had some great opportunities arise. They did several military world tours with the Air Force Reserve called Operation Seasons Greetings. How, how was that? That must have been a great experience. It was great. It's very humbling, man. It's, it's amazing to go over there and see those guys, you know, in action, really. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, very humbling. We got to go to the hospitals and visit the guys, and we served uh, – you know, Thanksgiving dinner in the mess hall to the guys and uh, Man, that's just cool. traveled all over, you know, playing shows and they were very appreciative until we also with us on tour was a New England Patriot cheerleader. So, you know, <laughs> we, would, we would be popular. They would be like invisible, you know, <laughs> that's another reason. weird bill. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. That's funny, man. So when they came on, you guys vanished. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's that's so day. funny. That's so funny, man. Uh, the band got another record deal and another album, and since then they've recorded and released a live album and a Christmas record. Restless Hearts released a total of nine albums. They continue performing pre-COVID, of course, 65 to 70 shows a year. As a session player, Greg's recorded with artists like Dan Seals, Ann Murray, Randy Travis, Asleep at the Wheel, what a band, the Osmond Brothers, as well as songs for motion pictures, including The Secret of My Success, Maverick and my heroes have always been cowboys, and he's also done a lot of jingle work for major brands. Are you still doing that? No, not much at all. Not much session work at all. Yeah, I guess COVID has put the kibosh on that, man. Yeah. Uh, he, Greg also is kind enough to mention that Tim Dubois went on to open and head. That was the original uh, songwriter who put those songs together and, and formed the band. Uh, he went on to open and head the Nashville division of Arista Records, launching the careers of Alan Jackson, Brooks and Dunn, Diamond Rio, Radney Foster, and others. And uh, another fellow, Scott Hendricks, was critical in helping Greg's career early on. He's become one of Nashville's most successful producers with more than 50 number one records, including uh, works by Alan Jackson, Brooks and Dunn, John Michael Montgomery, Trace Atkins, Blake Shelton, Dan and Shay, Faith Hill, and Restless Heart. Man, thank you uh, for coming on the show. I appreciate it. What a journey has been for you, man. I've been a very lucky guy. Thank you for having me. I, I know the pedigree of people you talk to on this show, so I'm a little, I'm kind of wondering what I'm doing here. But I, No, I, I, don't, <laughs> don't say that, man. Are you kidding? Absolutely not. Wash that out of your head. Wash that thought out of your head. Totally. I can, I, I'll, I can screw this up and say something real stupid in a second you'll feel right at home you'll say how the hell does this it'll go from wow this guy's got some good guests to how the hell does this guy get some good guests on the show? <laughs> but i'm pleased to have you thanks Rick. um you started taking lessons but after a while you stopped playing entirely and i was curious why'd you do that and then what made you pick it up again well i started out just at the at the basic music store and uh just basic Mel Bay book going through learning the notes and, and you know just basic stuff and then at one point the store hired a real guitar teacher a real jazz guy and uh, he was you know like I said he opened my ears up to people like Howard Roberts and, and Wes Montgomery and things like that but you know he was teaching me to play chord melodies to when Sonny gets blue and teaching <laughs> me the, the head to four by Miles Davis and you know I'm 10 11 years old and it's just not it just wasn't, I wasn't interested. It was above my head and I didn't grasp a lot of it. And, and I wanted to be, you know, like a normal kid. And I was into the Beatles and Herman's Hermits and, you know, things like that. So after a while, I just, I just didn't enjoy it. And I just kind of said, I don't want to take lessons anymore. Kind of disappointed my dad, but just put it away for a little while. Not very long, maybe a, a year. But I was still, you know, noodle around on it and playing the popular songs, trying to learn Ticket to Ride and things like that. But, what made you but, pick it up, like, more seriously? after a year? Um, I think we found another teacher that I went to, a guy named Julian Akins in Oklahoma City. And it was kind of more of the same stuff, more of the jazz stuff. But I, 
I kind of got interested in the guitar again, and it seemed like the the way to go. Plus, I've met some other people in, in, uh, in high school that were playing in like local bands, you know, doing some popular music, some creeks, Clearwater, and things like that. So that got my interest back up. That's cool, man. Uh, so, so you were in your fifth year of college. Was that because the CPA thing? The no, fifth year requirement? No, that's because I would start each semester with about 16 credit hours. And by the time I dropped everything, cause I <laughs> stayed out too late playing music, I'd end up with like nine, you know, or six credits at the end of the semester. And gotcha. it just drug on. It's, it's, it was just a, you know, I, I finished high school and it just seemed like the treadmill career path was just, you know, you finish high school, you go to college, you pick a, a direction, you get a job, you get married, you know, it's just kind of a, a treadmill, just the way things were. And uh, eventually I just decided, I don't like this. You know, I don't like this at all. I don't enjoy, you know, I was good at math. And I thought, well, what's a good career that uses math? I don't want to be a math teacher. Oh, accounting. Okay. I'll try accounting. But the parts of it I like, but at some point I just, you know, I really loved music at, uh, I think it was my junior year in college, I started dating a theater major, a gal that asked me to play in a production of Godspell. Oh, wow. Campus. So I did that and started hanging out with these, you know, theater types. And I just said, wow, you know, I really like this. This is, you know, I could be passionate about this. I would never be passionate about accounting. I would not want to keep up with tax law or this or that. So, you know, at, at one point it, it just seemed like, what do you really want to do? And also it almost got to a, a spiritual point of what, what talent do I have? What, what, what am I supposed to make the best of in this, in this world? And I thought, well, you know, I have a knack for music and I really like it. Maybe that's what I'm supposed to do. I mean, I, I don't know exactly where the road leads, but maybe that's just the right road to be on. And, and maybe that's enough. You know. So. What did your dad do for a living? He was an electrician. He worked at the FAA. He built uh, uh, the electronic components into flight simulators. So, oh, so he was a super smart dude. Well, he was a good electrician. He built yeah. uh, he built my first two amplifiers. He built you know one had like a five inch speaker, one had an eight inch, but they worked just great. He built me a metronome at one point, just a little. It made noise. It didn't go back, but you know it made a click. And uh, he built me my first uh, fuzz box. There was a company called Heathkit. You know it used to send out kits of the parts and he, they, he would assemble them. And he made my first fuzz box kind of against his will. But uh, That's cool. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. That was pretty, um, those conclusions you came to and just the, the fact that you thought about that, you know, where you said it became uh, what's going to make me happy. And then you said it almost became like a spiritual quest of, you know, what fills my soul sort of. Like, how did you think of that? Because at a young age, that's not super common. Like, I certainly couldn't put that together at that age, for sure. Well, that was college. You know, that was when I was deciding whether I needed to leave college and try to do something else. I tell you, there was a, an album at that point. I was a, a big fan of a guy named Todd Rundgren. And uh, he had an album called Initiation. There were some songs in there called Real Man and Fair Warning and, and, and just things that were really about finding your center and, and, you know, what, what are you supposed to do? What do you, you know, how are you going to make this world better and things like that. And, uh, I just really took it to heart. It really, you know, sunk in. That's, I think that's great, man. I think that's way ahead of the curve. Even for college age kid, that was pretty, pretty, uh, you know, to come up to, to think along those lines and then to come up with conclusions like that on your own, I, that's very powerful, man. Well, you know, my dad, like uh, like we were talking, you said earlier, he uh, he knew I loved music, but you know he knew my guitar teacher played funky beer joints and was always scrambling for for money. And you know, there's just no security in the music business for the most part in a lot of ways. So he just didn't want that for me. He wanted me to sure. make a better life for myself. So he was he only only wanted the best for me. But you know, yeah, sometimes you know they don't know exactly what you think the best thing for you is. Well, the fact that you looked at music like, like this was your spiritual journey, there's, you, you know, you can't replace that with something else, man. No, no, no. And I, I kind of, I kind of burned the bridge at, at college thinking, well, you know, it's, it's this or nothing. Cause I, I really, I really think this is what I'm supposed to do. And Good I was for like, you. 
to meet some other people in, in college that were also musically inclined that wanted to move to Nashville. And uh, if they hadn't have gone to Nashville, I don't know what, that I would have gone by myself. But luckily, I had some people to, to go with. Amazing, man. I hear these stories and there's always the serendipity of how everything comes together is just mind blowing, man. Like it is. one little thing, you know, if you hadn't met that gal that you were dating, I mean, just a million things like that. It's just really cool. Uh, once you moved to Nashville, how did you get things going in the beginning? Uh, like what kind of work were you doing musically and what were some of your early challenges? Well, when, uh, Tim Dubois moved to Nashville the year before Scott and I did. He uh, he had talked to Scott about coming out to visit one Christmas, and I was going to go with Scott. And Tim said, well, they're holding auditions for this theme park out here called Opryland, and they hire a lot of performers and musicians to play on the different shows. And I think, you you know, it's just something you could do. It would give you at least three months of work if you move to town. And once you come audition for it, come out with Scott and audition. So I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll try it. I'll give it a shot. Tim's wife had sort of mistakenly heard, well, they, they want you to do like a 10 minute program, but it's really like a two minute. So <laughs> I had structured my performance a little too slow to start with and, and you know, it was going to end with a bang, but I never got there. What I had done is I had made this uh, backup recording. I was going to do this uh, song by Speedy West and Jimmy Bryan, an old thing called, uh, old Joe Clark, a little fast kind of picking thing. And I'd made a, a backup tape with, you know, playing guitar and bass and you know, just something to accompany myself with on a reel to reel. And I took it out there to the audition. And when they played it on their reel to reel, it ran just that much faster than, than what I had recorded it. And I was out of tune the whole thing. And I got flustered and I just thought, Oh man, this is, this is horrible. I said, I never mind, give up. You know? So I you know, left there just, Defeated, came back home to Oklahoma, didn't know what I was going to do. And then later I found out that Opryland was holding auditions in Norman, Oklahoma, at the University of Oklahoma. So I decided I'd try again. And this time I made another backing track, but this time I put a little test tone tuning note at the okay. start. Of so as soon as I heard that note and hit the guitar, I went, oh, wait, stop, got in tune. And then played, and it went, you know, it went pretty good. It did okay. And the, the guy that was hiring, the, the guitarist that was uh, the music director at Opryland, Lloyd Wells, came up to me later and said, you know, we've got an opening in the country show here at, at Opryland, and I think you can do it. So he offered me the job. I said, absolutely. Now, this was so, up in Oklahoma they were having? Or yeah, they, they, tra have they traveled all around the country to different places to do auditions for, for people, for performers at the park. So I'd gotten wind that they were coming to Oklahoma. That's so wild. I, down there. So uh, I moved in uh, May of 78 and uh, had three months of work. You know, I had a, a salary for three months. After that, I, uh, Scott had, was working at a, a place called National Studio Systems Direct Disc Labs, and they had they made direct disc recordings of they did Lenny Bro, they did Larry Coriel with the Brubeck Brothers, things like that. And I would I was an assembly line worker for a little while. They put the shrink wrap on the albums, put them in the box, tape the box, put them on the pallet, move the pallet, and stack that. And then somehow someone in that office had gotten wind that I had some accounting training, and they moved me to the bookkeeping department. Ah, there you go, man. So I had away from college to get away from accounting. And by, by you know, <laughs> three months, I was in, a, in an office doing basic bookkeeping. <laughs> That was not the greatest, but that got me through that first winter anyway. And then uh, the next season, I started to get at Opryland. And, uh, you know, you start to meet people and you network a little bit. And this guy knows that guy who's, you know, knows an engineer who's got some free time at the studio. You want to come play on this? And, uh, you know, just one thing leads to another. Also, working at Opryland, it was connected to a big complex, the Opryland Hotel, which was a big convention center and tourism is a big industry in, in Nashville. So after working your day shift at the park, they would get you doing like dinner gigs at the, uh, at the hotel. You could do your day shift and then go do a, a strolling fiddle and guitar or do a dinner trio and then do a dance gig after that. So, you know, one thing would lead to another and it got to be a pretty good living between that and starting to do a little bit of session work. By the third year, things started, started to come together. The second winter was really 
the worst one. That's I had to go on unemployment for a while. That was a, a little bit of a grim time. But uh, after the start of the third year, so things, things started really happening. That's great. And in retrospect, that's not that long. You know, it feels like long when you're going through it, but you're looking back, you're like, hey, man, two years to get started, that's pretty reason. Two and a half, three years, yeah. that's pretty reasonable. Yeah, yeah, that's nothing to complain about for sure. And like, you know, being able to walk into town and have three months of work, not just to be able to walk into town and go, what am I going to do? You know, where can I go to be heard? So it was a great, great training ground and a great way to meet people in your similar situation and, and go from there. Did you meet anybody back in those early days that you're still friends with? Oh, yeah, lots of people, you know. Uh, Jimmy O had to work out there. You know Jimmy probably. From yeah. Diamond, you know, and, uh, yeah, I had him on here. You know, there's still lots of people that were performers out at the park that, that did other things in the music business around town. So I see a lot of them every so often, yeah. Oh, that's cool, man. That's very cool. And from, I've talked to people who've worked in either Opryland or Disneyland situations. It's you're playing a lot like you're really getting your chops home from what i understand it was a it was an hour show you do three times a day you know sometimes you do the morning shift sometimes the evening shift but yeah you do a lot of quite a bit of playing like i said that in in combination with other other gigs at the hotel yeah you do quite a bit of play that's great man hey talk about meeting uh 19 year old dan huff and how he helped you. And I realized I spelled Dan with one N. He's the only guy I've ever heard of spells Dan with two N's, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, Scott was working at, as an engineer at Soundstage, and he kept telling me about this kid that, you know, you've got to hear this kid play. He's something else. He, he was going to college at Belmont, and they had this little band called the Belmont Reasons that, you know, was their kind of college house band. But he also did a lot of session work in the contemporary Christian field. His dad, Ron Huff is a big string arranger for a lot of the Christian albums and things. And one day I went down there and heard this kid and I, my jaw just hit the floor. I thought, I'd, I've never heard anybody this good. And he was doing, at age 19, he was big into Al DiMiola and was doing all that muted, fast picking stuff. And I thought, that is just amazing. And, uh, got to be a little bit of, not you know, not good friends with him or anything, but uh, we got to kind of know each other a little bit. And I worked with a some of the other guys that were in that Reasons band. And uh, at one point, Dan had just pretty much maxed out in Nashville. He wasn't going to be like the, at that point, he wasn't interested in being like the first call country, you know, session guy. He was more into the pop and, and rock stuff and was doing all the really hip rock and pop contemporary Christian albums. And then he decided to move to uh, L.A. and, you know, went out there and just killed it. But uh, when he left, it kind of left a little opening there for some other people to get in. And uh, he, you know, he recommended me for some, for some things that, that really helped out. I mean, That's he got great. to a certain point. There's, you know, there's the A-team session work and there's stuff that he wasn't going to do anymore, like the, some of the demo, writer demos. And there's a lot of custom gospel work where you'll go in and like do an album in a day. You know, you'll go in and crank out 10 songs from a custom album. And he, I, you know, he recommended for a lot of that stuff, but you know, pays good money. So it yeah. really one thing leads to another and, you know, you just start to build that, that network and you, you know, start to move up the ladder a little bit. That's the best thing about the music business, man. If you just work hard and you're nice, other, you're going to get more business, man. It may not happen on your time frame. Yeah. Yeah. But it's going to happen for sure. Yeah, it rarely happens in leaps and bounds, but you know, little by little. And like you said, just be a nice guy, be a good hang, do your job well, you know, be not, you know, be a good friend to people. And uh, eventually the world will turn. Yeah. Yeah, totally, man. Uh, all right. One of the uh, early issues you had with being in Wrestle's Heart was touring. I guess at that time, your session career after all that hard work you're doing was finally starting to take off. It was, I was at a crossroads. Yeah. I was starting, if I had really devoted myself to that, I feel like I, you know, I could have done, done all right with that. And, it was, you know, at that point, the road and session world were like two totally different things. Going out on the road with a country artist was like, you know, 200 days a year. You're never going to be home. It's, uh, were you single or mar married then? I was single. Okay. Single. But I still didn't want to, you know, travel 200 days a year. And I like, I like, you know, 
going down to the studio. Like, I enjoyed playing in the studio. I enjoyed making, you know, records and things like that. So uh, playing on stage didn't have that much of an appeal to me. Like, playing in the studio was more interesting. So it was, it was a tough decision about do I, you know, I know if I lose my place in line here, you know, I may not get back kind of a thing. You know, it's out of sight, out of mind. And, totally. You know, you know, people make other alliances and, you know, start making other loyalties to other people. And, you know, you can't blame them if you're not available to do the, to do the gigs. So, but, you know, thing, it was great music with the band and we had a really great opportunity with, with Joe Galante and, and RCA records. And he really believed in us and, it just looked like doors were opening in that direction. We're going to have a record deal. We're going to open for Alabama. We're going to have great support by all of the greatest labels in Nashville at the time. So I decided to give it a shot. Yeah. Good that you did, man. That is a good thing. Uh, from 90, from, sorry, from 83 till 94, you guys had a great run. I was curious Greg, what you'd say your top three musical experiences were during that time? Gosh, uh, we got to do some great TV stuff, some great uh, shows. You know, we got to be on American Bandstand with Dick Clark. How, how was that, man? That had to be so cool. That was surreal, you know, because I've grown up watching that. Yeah. Movie, so Dick Clark, you know, he was like an icon. And from that, he, he liked us, and we got to do a bunch of other Dick Clark productions on Rockin' New Year's Eve and, and some other Fourth of July, things like that. And we got to do uh, uh, The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Uh, That's cool. My dad grew up watching that show, so I was always trying to stay up late and watch a little of that with him. Uh, we did uh, the Grammys one year in, at Radio City Music Hall. We were up for... Uh, I think song by a country duo or group, but it was the same year that Linda Ronstadt, Dolly Parton, and Amy Lou Harris decided to make a record called The Trio. And they were a duo or group at the time, not vocal event. So we didn't win that one, but we got to perform. And it was the same year that Michael Jackson debuted uh, Man in the Mirror. And uh, on the front row, as we were performing our little segment, there's Quincy Jones, Michael Jackson and Paul McCartney, like right on the front row. And you're playing, how we, how we're, that, that had to be surreal. That was surreal, but luckily they wanted tracks at that show. You know, some of those award shows want you to play your tracks because it's such a nightmare at that point to try to switch mics on a bunch of different acts. You know, it's a different world now with digital boards, I guess, and all that. But, but back then, you know, it was, it was almost preferred in some situations to play to a track. So luckily I didn't have to play. I did have to sing, but, I wasn't playing, so I would, man, I would have been big time. Wow. You would have been nervous, yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, at, did your dad come around at one point and sort of like, you know, give you the attaboy that all kids want, all boys want from their dad? Absolutely. At, uh, I guess it was 1987 or 88. I'm an only child, so they were back in Oklahoma by themselves. And they decided that they wanted to move to Nashville. So they come out and uh, moved in with me, basically. And lived oh, my God. For, lived for about six months. It didn't last all that long. At that point, I said, you like this house? Why don't you stay here and I'll go look at it. <laughs> <laughs> great yeah. to have Not quite that close. But. No, I, I get it, man. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, once we got the record deal and once I, w I came back from the Tonight Show and I'd gone to the NBC shop and brought him a Tonight Show hat and he, he wore that Tonight Show hat everywhere. And then he was like my biggest supporter. You know, he was, couldn't have been prouder. That had to feel great. Yeah, absolutely. That's nice, man. That is really cool. I'm glad you got to experience that. That's probably important. Uh, I, 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 I patted you on the back for mentioning this because this is the reality of the music business. You mentioned earlier, you decided to try to get back into session work and you spent most of 95 waiting for the phone to ring, but it rarely did. Uh, how did you handle this both as a musician and then just emotionally as someone looking to make a living, man? Cause I've been in that situation before and it is not fun. It's not fun at all. It was, it was kind of a, a crushing thing because, you know, well, it's been almost 10 years. So, you know, things had changed. Like I said, people had 
you know, people I used to work for had, had you know, made other bonds and loyalties to other people and were using them. And it was kind of like starting from scratch all over again. And, you know, the world had changed session wise. There were no racks anymore. I had been a rack guy and that was all amps and pedals. And it was a whole retooling and, uh, and I'm not so sure that I, that my heart was in it, you know, after being an artist, it was hard to go back and, and take orders in some, in some yeah. situation. So, uh, I get that. So if you're, first of all, you know, there weren't that many opportunities because like I said, the phone just didn't ring that much. I wasn't in, I wasn't in the demand I thought I would be. So luckily I'd saved some money, you know, and, uh, I was able to eke it out for a, a year, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was not a fun time and it was pretty, pretty humbling, pretty depressing in a lot of ways. I was going to say you're, you seem super humble now at that time. Were you the same way or would, did, you know, you were younger. Did you have a little bit more of an ego and it was like, Hey, you know, more devastating from that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm sure. Or ego, but uh, that will humble you quickly. You know? Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Man, needing money humbles you. I mean, that's, it, it's, yeah, it's a tough, I've been there a couple of times in my life. Uh, and thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Uh, when Vince called you to be in his band, I would imagine at that time, one of the reasons you felt you weren't on par was because you had low confidence because of this whole situation. Uh, how did you, was that, was that accurate or? Well, that's some of it. Yeah, I did have low confidence, but also that band of Vince's, I mean, <laughs> Everybody in that band was a mother. I mean, you know, Vince operates at a very high level and expects everyone around him and surrounds himself with people that operate at a very high level. So, uh, you know, I had gone from being a hotshot artist to being like the worst guy in the band, low man on the totem pole. And it, it was a shock, but, you know, you kind of pull up your pull up your boots and get after it and work a little harder. And, you know, little by little, I started to feel more more comfortable in that situation. It was, I mean, what a great honor to be, to be in a guitar player's band of that, uh, of that level. I, you know, I'd heard of Vince even as far back as being in Oklahoma because, uh, you know, he's an OP he, too. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. There was a band in Oklahoma city called mountain smoke. I never got to go see him, but I knew there was this hotshot bluegrass band called mountain smoke. And I'd heard of this guy, Vince Gill. First time I'd seen, I saw Vince play though, was when I got to Nashville and he was in Roseanne Cash's band. And uh, he signed with RCA about the same time we did. So early on, he even opened some shows for us. This wow. Kind of, yeah. yeah. So we'd been friends with him for a long time. He eventually left RCA to go to MCA. The, the label head at RCA didn't want him to write his own music, thought, you know, they wanted to do all the A&R for him, like provide the songs. And Vince said, I don't, I don't want to do that. I want to run my own music. So he moved over to MCA where Tony Brown, an old friend of his was. And Vince and Tim Goubois wrote When I Call Your Name, which is one of the first songs. Oh. That map. And from then on, man, he was like, you know, star bound. Who else was in that band? In the Roseanne Cash's band? No, in, in Vince's band that he called you up to be in. Oh, gosh. The John Huey, the legendary steel player that played with Conway Twitty for many years. Uh, Two drum, Martin Parker, a drummer I'd worked with a long time in Nashville. Billy Thomas, a drummer who had been in a band called McBride and the Ride. Uh, oh. A keyboard player named Joey Schmidt, who'd been with Keith Whitley and Steve Warner and a lot of people. Uh, Pete Wozner. Uh, two guitar players, a guy named Jeff White and uh, a guy who played guitar and fiddle, Jeff Guernsey. I mean, the fiddle player was maybe a better guitar player than anybody else in the band. That's how... <laughs> high level of operating was that situation so it was a big band two drummers and the bass player jimmy johnson who'd been with Roy orbison i mean these were all you know hot shot cats you know and uh for me to walk in there it was it was <laughs> it was humbling and, and an awakening yeah how long did did it take you to feel better or to you got to the point where you felt you were carrying your load the way you, you wanted to it took a good half a year or so. Yeah, that's reasonable. That, that's Yeah, that's very reasonable. Look, man, you got to look at it this way. Vince Gill could pick anybody. The yeah. fact that he picked you, there's something there that, you know, that had, that had to be comforting, man. 
That was that was a, a confidence builder right there. Yeah, yeah. If he oh. thinks I can, maybe I can do it. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Uh, Ressa's heart has reunited several times. Have you ever thought about doing something else throughout any of these times, like a your own band or a solo project or a different band? At, at one point, I thought about maybe trying to get into production, you know, because I enjoyed that part of the studio too. I like being able to meld different elements together to create a finished product. And uh, but that uh, never really panned out. So it was uh, luckily whenever things would go into another valley, the band would suddenly, you know, rise up again to to rescue me. Seemed like. Gotcha. Uh, we mentioned earlier, Nakoma Park. I looked on the S Wikipedia and the census from last year said there's 2,500 people <laughs> in there. And that's today. On a good day, maybe, yeah, on a good that, day. That's today, man. What was it like growing up there? Like, what was your childhood like? Gosh, you know, normal, nothing out of the ordinary, I don't guess. A lot of bike riding around, you know, a lot of flat open spaces to, to ride around in and, you know, playing with the neighborhood kids. And uh, uh, my grandparents lived nearby and uh, had lots of cousins to, to play with and stuff. So uh, just a normal, you know, Midwestern suburban childhood. All your family was there. That probably was really good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, tell me one or two things you've done, Greg, that kind of like the Vince thing, I guess, at the time were out of your comfort zone, but hindsight 2020 turned into big breakthroughs for you. Well, I'll tell you one thing that happened not all that long ago. I know you're a big, I think you're a big workout buff, right? Yeah, yeah, I like working out. I've been doing it a long time. <laughs> I had never, never done that in my life. Never was, you know, a, a sports guy that much. Was never very good at anything. Never, always had sort of a weight issue, you know, because I like to eat and drink so much. But uh, I have developed this problem with my shoulder. It just, it just ached all the time and I, it hurt to play and I couldn't sleep at night. I could never get comfortable. I thought, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And my wife had been working out with a, with a personal trainer at this facility and she knew of another guy there that gave massages like deep tissue massage type stuff. And so I thought, well, I'll go see him and see what that's all about. So I went down there and talked to this guy and he put me through like a series of movements and stuff and said, you know, I could do the massage thing, but your posture, man, you've spent so many years, you know, hunched over and playing guitar and stuff. Give me, give me eight sessions to work out with and let's work on your posture and see if we can't fix some things. And so I decided to hire a personal trainer and started working out like three times a week. And I never thought I would enjoy anything like that, but I mean, I, I love it. I've been doing it like three and almost four years now and I feel better than I ever have. I have trimmer probably than I've ever been. And my outlook on things is so much better. I'm a happier person and just you know, everything, everything is just better because of that. Man, I, never, that, I gotta tell you, God's honest truth. I was sitting here saying, man, this guy looks like he works out. And I didn't want to say anything because it would be, so whatever you're doing, it's working. Let me tell you what, because I have posture issues too. Have you ever heard of this? It's called a, a bow tie. No. Man, I'll send you the link for it. Uh, you put this on your back. I wear it for an hour a day and it forces you to be straight. And also my older son, he is involved with mobility for his for for a living like he helps people with wheelchair stuff and he gave me all these uh links to do these mo it's like a new thing instead of getting surgery you do these mobility and it's really helped me man so i'll send you those if you're interested yeah yeah please do i'd love to see that stuff oh my god it's changed my life and you know you'd think well how's this but two or three months into it all of a sudden you start feeling better and and I was thinking you were going to say posture because that I had the same man. When you get over fifty, that the, the check engine light comes on a little more, man, and that's why. Right. <laughs> that's <laughs> one of them. Yeah, man, I'll get you that stuff. That's good. I'm glad that that's cool, man. That you're working out. That definitely changes your life, doesn't it? Don't you feel better like 
like you said, more optimistic and. Yeah, man, just all the way around instead of, uh, I'm definitely in the fourth quarter now, but instead of crawling across the finish line, I feel like I can sprint now. You That's know? right, man. Right on, right on. Uh, let's talk about gear for a few minutes. What is your go-to guitar right now and what other two would round out your top three? And has that changed over the years? Yeah. Um, several years ago, I got this garage. Uh, it's called an NOS Retro, and it's uh, basically a strap. I happen to have it right here. I'll give you a quick glance at it. Yeah, that's the green. That's a seafoam green-ish. I don't. It's so cool looking, man. I it, love that. It calls it tie dye. I guess he, you know, like puts on several layers of paint and then, uh, you know, sands through the different layers and then glosses over it. So, yeah, I just fell in love with this guitar. And uh, one thing I always do with a strap is there's always there's usually a knob right there. You know, that's always in my way. So I always take that knob off. You just have a master volume and tone. I have other strats that just have a hole there, you know. And then uh, for this guitar, we move the jack over to the side and move the uh, a volume control for a piezo bridge here. So this oh. is here. So I come stereo out into a, a little uh, radial tone bone makes a thing called a, a PZ select. It lets okay. you select to. So the uh, magnetics go to the amp and the piezo goes out to the front of the house. So That's I can switch, cool. you know, play a couple of notes on acoustic or strum a bit and then play electric too. So, you know, one guitar will get you through a whole gig. That's, I would never think you had a piezo in there. That's re I've never seen that on a Strat, honestly. It's a, a bags makes it's called an X bridge bags, LR bags. Wonderful thing. That uh, radio tone bone has a, uh, like a piezo boost on it that really brings that thing to life too. I've, I've never played through another DI that, that makes the bridge sound that good. That's cool, man. And that's a gr gr spell that name of that guitar. Grosh, G R O S H. Don Grosh, near uh, just outside of Denver, Colorado. It's, it's a beautiful guitar, man. I love the dark uh, wood of the uh, fretboard. I like dark. dark yeah, yeah. Plays great. Uh, what, what would be number two and number three? Number two probably be an acoustic I have. It's a Collings uh, OM2H. It's a Rosewood and uh, Engelman Spruce guitar with a cutaway. Great, great acoustic. Plays great, sounds great. Beyond that, gosh, there's so many to choose from. I have a, I have a couple of other garages that are really nice. I have a... Uh, Recently, I got a thing called a Cervantes nylon string guitar. It's, a, it's called a crossover guitar. It's like the nylon string guitar for non-classical players. You know, it's got a little bit more of a, an arch to the fingerboard, and it's a little more it's friendlier than the giant classical mat. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So I really love that guitar for, like, playing Jerry Reed type stuff or, you know, bossa nova things. God, the fact that you could even play that is like, <laughs> that, so, that stuff's impossible, both of them, man. Yeah, it's not fun. It is fun. It is fun, yeah, for when you can play it. Me, not so much. <laughs> what are you playing through most of the time, like on stage and in the studio? Uh, on stage right now, I've got a uh, um, Fender Blues Deluxe that has a uh, Celestian Vintage 30 in it. I really like a uh, – I found that I really like the American voiced amp with a British speaker because the, uh, you know, the fenders, great top, great bottom, not a whole lot of mids. And the British speaker adds just enough of that mid range to where you still get a great clean sound, but it takes, uh, takes dirt pedals a lot better. It seems like, you know, so it's, it just rounds the whole thing out. One of my favorite amps in that same vein is, a it's called a Shaw built by a guy named Kevin Shaw. Yeah. I heard that. Lebanon. It's called a, uh, exit 209 B. He calls it a, uh, like a 45 watt Princeton. It's just a very basic Fender sort of circuit, but I've got a Celestial Gold with that one. I really, really love that amp. Yeah, I've heard of his amps. Sure. And what are you playing in the studio usually? Uh, that Shaw, or I also have a Sur Badger, little 18. I was gonna show you, if you uh, back when I was doing sessions back in the day, and on the first four, Restless Heart albums, I was going direct. I mean, back when direct was, you know, not that popular. I think this was like 1982. And there was a guy here in town, he was a good guitar player, 
guy named Mo West. He was like electronics wizard, genius. First guy I saw with one of these units was Gordon Kennedy. I don't know who Gordon Kennedy no. is. Uh, great songwriter, wrote uh, Change the World for Eric Clapton. And uh, oh. his dad, Jerry Kennedy, who uh, uh, played the riff on Pretty Woman for Roy Orbison. Great session. Player. Oh, yeah, a Nashville guy. Yeah, Nashville guy, yeah. And then the, the second guy I saw was uh, Dan Huff, who had one of these things. It's called a Quest unit. And it came out, I want to say, if not, it was the same year as, this, as the Rockman, but maybe it was in development even before Tom Scholes had come out with the Rockman. And I, I don't know if you can see this. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And it was uh, one of the first things that I saw that you could have presets. And Look it's, how uh, big that is, man. Yeah, it's, you know, and it had an additional delay. But you'd come in and you'd have a, it had an input gain, compression, a distortion circuit, and then you had a filter from a Prophet 5 synthesizer. So you'd set a resonance, a cutoff, and set the low pass, and that would be your speaker simulator. You would build your speaker simulator from the Prophet 5 filter, and it was remarkably accurate. So then it also had like a modulation section, a little built-in short delay, and then an effects return for a, an additional delay. But I want to show you the cool thing also about this, as far as the presets, if you're on preset zero, these knobs here work. And if you can see, there's LEDs at the top here. Yeah. And as you turn the knob, the LEDs will change brightness. Yeah, I see that. So for each preset, there's a row of thumb wheels here mm -hmm. that you would roll to change the brightness of the LED. So you would set up your sound here on zero and then go to one and match the brightness level with the thumb wheel to whatever this control was set. And that's how you'd set up your presets. And then that's how it would store it. And there'd be a foot switch. So, you know, before there were rack switching systems and all that, you were able to get, you know. That's stored. really cool. Isn't that wild? What did that cost back in the day? I think it was like fifteen hundred bucks, sixteen hundred bucks. Wow! What's amazing is now you get that for about two fifty and yeah, and <laughs> double the size of your iPhone. That's crazy, man. But that was pretty cool. That it I mean, was, yeah. pretty it was diverse. Uh, you know, some people loved it. Some people, you know, kind of tilted their head sideways and where's your amp? You know, that's but awesome. I, and so, several times I'd be like in my in the studio with an amp sitting right next to it and it'd be blazing I couldn't hear all that well and what I thought the sound was, I was getting was not what the engineer was hearing I'd go into the control room and go that was that my sound so this was sort of an attempt to have more control of what I was hearing was the same thing they were hearing so sure and it did it were you satisfied with it for the most part I was, like yeah. I said the first Russell's Heart Records were made was strictly that. That's awesome, man. Uh, ever sell a guitar that you wish you could get back? No, not a guitar. I wish I could get that Red Harmony back the one that was stolen. Yeah. I, uh, I got rid of a Fender Super Reverb amp once that I wish I had still had. I traded it for a... I didn't think it was loud enough at the time. I traded it for this huge Ampeg V2, which was like, <laughs> God, I don't know what I was thinking. Eventually got rid of that and got a PV Mace, which was maybe the heaviest amp ever. Oh, really? Um, two, 212 combo, but man, was it heavy. Yeah. Uh, Greg, what, do you remember the first album you ever bought? It was probably a Chet Atkins record, but I can't remember which one. First, like, pop or rock album I ever bought was probably a Herman's Hermits record. It's funny you mentioned them before. They were a good band. They were a good band. I'll tell you a little story about that, too. Um, we were doing the Opry one uh, Friday or Saturday, and uh, backstage was Peter Noon from uh, Herman's Hermits. His daughter, Natalie Noon, was going to college at Belmont College. Wow. So he stage, and we got to meet him and chat with him, and our drummer said, you know, we're, at, we're thinking about doing a little project where we can, you know, do songs with other artists and things, you know, would you be interested in doing something like that with us? And he said, well, yeah, sure. So we ended up doing a version of, uh, there's a kind of hush all over the world with uh, great song. Afternoon, yeah. So we did that. I did the uh, track at my house and he came over and sang in my laundry room. And, 
you know, from like my first record to this guy's in my laundry room. And then after that, uh, our keyboard player and his wife had been doing some volunteer work with the Nashville Rescue Mission. And the idea came up to do a, a couple of benefit concerts called Music with a Mission. And we were going to do it with the Nashville Symphony. And we got the uh, symphony to donate their time. And we got the hall donated. And we had called other artists to come join us and, and perform all the money going to the Nashville Rescue Mission. And I called up Peter Noon and said, would you be interested in, in doing that with us? He said, sure. And he wanted to do uh, Mrs. Brown, You've Got a Lovely Daughter. And I happened to have at that time. I had one of those Gretsch guitars that had the mute, you know, the little felt mute that you'd switch and it would give it that muted sound. Okay. So here I am years later, I get to play the guitar part on Mrs. Brown with Peter Noon in the Nashville Symphony Hall. Is that the one where they go, I love her, she won't, isn't that that song? Or is it's, that? You've got a lovely daughter. He, his, their accent was so strong. Unlike, you know, a lot of most English guys, they don't have an accent, but they had a, very strong accent when they sang. Yeah, he told me about cutting their records, and you know, Jimmy Page was a session guy playing on their records. He told me, you know, when they cut their records, it was basically you just go into the studio and play the songs you knew. So he said when they cut their first record, they went in in the morning, and in a three-hour session, they'd cut their entire first record. And coming in that afternoon for the next three-hour session, was Eric Burden and the Animals, and they cut their first record that same day. So that, you know, one day, Herman's Hermits, the Animals, both of their first records. Now, wow. Imagine being like the engineer or the producer in that, in that place. What a, like, what a dream gig that is. No kidding, yeah. Uh, that's so cool that you get to play with him, man. I know, I know. It was like a dream country. Give me your top three Desert Island discs. No particular order and just for this moment. Whoa, gosh. Um, maybe that initiation record by Todd. Um, something by Joni Mitchell, maybe. Something by Steely Dan. Or, or a guitar record would be uh, Michael Landau's Tales from the Bulge, which is, I really I love that record. You know what? I just got that Fender, I don't know if you can see, the Fender, the black Fender Strat. Uh, yeah. I wanted an HSS, and so they have one on reverb, good price. It's supposedly the, the humbucker's a Landau pickup. Ooh. So it sounds really smooth. I only got it like a week ago. I'm still playing with it. I have a funny feeling the electronics need to be rewired. They're just a little offish, so I'm going to take it in to get fixed. But the pickups sound great, man. Yeah. Yeah, really good. I'm what like, that guy is, huh? Yeah. I don't, I don't even know how he gets done what he does, man, to be honest with you. Greg, tell me the uh, most important things you've learned about yourself. Uh, I guess that if I'm faced with a challenge, I can, I can, uh, I can have the discipline and the uh, resolve to, to get through it. You know, I, I won't quit. You know, I, I have the, the ability to stick to something and, and plow through it. Man, amen to that, right? That's great. What, uh, what makes you happy? Uh, family, the wife, you know, good friends, good food, animals. Man, I love animals. It's funny. I, you know, that's all I, people are going crazy on Facebook. I just watch like cat videos and like a, a rescue videos of dogs that never oh. stress. That don't oh. stress me out at all. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, you see a zebra and a rhino being buddies. It's like, that's good vibes, man. I don't ever get stressed out and watch politics or something. I was always a dog person. Haven't owned one in, in many years, but my wife has always been after me to get a cat. You gotta get a cat. I don't want a cat. I don't want a cat in the house. Finally, I give in, we get a cat. It's like, she's daddy's girl now. <laughs> love her to death. Now we have two cats. So. That's cool, man. Yeah, um, pets are awesome. Yeah. Uh, they always, they never reject you. You know, they never, you, you want to go pet an animal, man, that you're never going to get turned down, ever. They're never having a bad day for you, you know. Great for your blood pressure, for sure. Yeah, which is, which is great. Uh, something or someone you miss from your childhood? Uh, 
my parents, you know, I wish they were still around to ask questions, you know, find out some things, some, find out some more about the history that I wish I'd paid more attention to find, you know, get some more advice when I need it about, you know, things that I don't know about. Yeah. I, I, I'd give anything to have another day or two with them. Man, that's really nice to hear. Thank you for sharing that, man. Uh, happiest moment or time in your life? Oh, probably those first four or five years with the band when we were like on top of the world, man. It was high school with money. It was like, you know, we were <laughs> it was high school with money. That's awesome. And we were opening for Alabama and the Judds and Hank Jr. And, and this, you know, just traveling on a bus and playing for lots of people and getting adulation and respect from peers. And yeah, that was a great time. A great time. Man, you've got a bunch of good quotes here. I have to, I'll, I'll read them all before I got to figure out which one I'm going to use to put on the top of here. Uh, who, who's had the biggest influence on your life uh, musically and then also personally? Gosh. Well, my dad, I guess, first of all, because he was the first one I heard play guitar and because of his interest in, in music and playing guitar, it kind of put the seed in me. But, uh, you know, Chet Atkins, music. I used to love, I grew up with my ear next to the speaker listening to him. And Howard Roberts was the first really jazz guitar player that I could, that I could understand. It wasn't so, so obscure and so harmonically out that, you know, I could, he was still very melodic and almost had kind of a pop rock edge to his playing too. It was, you know, very accessible. I really loved that about him. I agree with you with him, man. I've tried to listen to so many jazz cats and it's just a little too difficult frankly I for me that my foot to you know I, um, it gets away from me yeah yeah uh and how about personally your dad probably yeah yeah probably so uh you have any hobbies outside of music i love to try to cook man i was a, i was a i'm a junkie for cooking shows and cookbooks and you know trying recipes i've had to kind of taper back on that you know because the pounds come on faster than you <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm cooking for two people. It's hard to make a huge recipe, and then you got to live with leftovers for the next two weeks. Or whatever. Yeah. But I do enjoy good food, and I appreciate a good chef, and I enjoy the the chemistry of you know ingredients, almost like you know producing music or writing songs. You know, it's the the chemistry of it all. I really enjoy food and cooking. Number one hobby for musicians. Is it really? Yeah, at least, I mean, in the 800 people I've spoken to, you know. I understand, you know, I understand. Yeah, yeah, I get yeah. it. Yeah. Everybody says the same thing. I love it. It's kind of like making music. It's like producing a record. You take a little. It, yeah, it, yeah. I totally get that, man. Favorite place you've traveled, Greg? Gosh, uh, went to Hawaii with Vince. Vince was uh, like uh, hosting a golf tournament and playing in a golf tournament and he flew the whole band out to Maui. We played, I think two days and sat around for seven more, you know, so that was great. We are doing the, uh, uh, the world tour with the, the air force reserve, got to see some cool places in Germany and Turkey. And, uh, uh, we got to play in Iraq. I don't know how cool that was, but it was, you know, pretty, pretty amazing. Pre yeah. I think that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I've been a lot of cool places. I love the Pacific Northwest as far as the United States. I love that whole beautiful, whole area. ain't it? Yeah, yeah. There's nothing like it. I mean, I'm here in Florida where it's just flat. We drove out, you know, we went out there and we drove up some. It, it it's like I'm not a religious person, but that's like God's handiwork, man. Putting that, yeah. I mean, that's just amazing. We did a couple of tours with the Judds. I think where we like flew into Seattle and met the bus, and then just took the bus down the coast, all through Washington, Oregon, Northern California. And I'm telling you, that's just some of the most beautiful country I've ever seen. I just love it out there. Yeah, I agree with you. Man. Uh, toughest decision that you've had to make or the most difficult thing you've had to do? Quit college to disappoint my folks and, you know, take on a, a whole new path. That was, that was probably the most difficult thing to do. And it paid off, so that's good. So far, fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, two more questions, and thank you so much for all your time and candor. Uh, biggest change in your personality 
over the last 10 years and how much of that is intentional and how much has just been a part of aging? Um, I guess I'm just more comfortable in my own skin now. I don't, uh, I don't worry so much about other people's opinion of me. I, you know, I realize there's certain things I can do and certain things I can't do. I, you know, I, I'm good at certain things musically. I'm not so good at certain things musically. I'll, I'm probably pretty good at coming up with something catchy for eight bars, but I'll never blow five courses of working man blues. It'll, you know, <laughs> uh, that's just not, not what I do, but, uh, but I'm okay with that. You know, yeah. the music I, make, I bring to the table and whatever fingerprint I have, I'm, I'm okay with it. I, you know, I don't stress about it anymore. The number one answer for people over 50, some, some, some version of that. And everybody's like, yeah, man, it's great. I wish it, it's like this, I took a million pound weight off my chest, you know, not having to worry about stuff like that. Yeah, man, that's yeah. cool. And uh, last question, best advice you've ever been given and who gave it to you? If you could remember. Gosh. Um, my dad would always tell me that, you know, Always surround yourself with people smarter than you, which, you know. Great advice. I had a, uh, a sax player I worked with once to tell me that, uh, you know, if, if uh, another musician takes your gig, don't, don't be mad at that musician. You got to ask yourself, why was he able to take your gig? You know, it's like before you point the finger at somebody else, look at yourself and see what, you know, what you could have done to, to make things, you know, better or, you know, it's like with Vince, you look at Vince and you go, the guy's undeniable. I mean, he's just a great singer, player, writer. He's undeniable. So just work at trying to be undeniable, you know? That's good advice, man. Well, hey, let me just tell you, you had some nuggets here, man. I just want to restate them. They were really good. Uh, now I'll see if I could read my writing. Uh, if I'm faced with a challenge, I won't quit. Um, it, the first four or five years of the band, it was like high school with money. That's one of the funniest things I've heard anybody say, to be honest with you. Uh, a very sweet thing. I, I, I'd give anything to have another day with them, with my, your parents. It was very sweet. Uh, and surround yourself with smarter people, man. I got a bunch of choice things to pluck here and put. I always put a quote from the interviews. So thank you. Uh, let me tell people um, any word on restless heart tours next year or anything like that we've got shows on the books i think we've got uh you know at this point 25 30 shows on the books if they if they stick you know it just we've had that happen so much this year we've had a lot of shows on the books but as the date would come closer well the promoter would get freaked out about this or that and decide either to postpone or cancel and things you know just things just went away and you know since february i think we've done maybe five shows well, that's probably five more than a lot of people did. So in this, you know, yeah. it is, it's, yeah. And some people just canceled their whole years. So, you know, in one way we're lucky, and, but hopefully, you know, pray for that vaccine, man. Things, hopefully things will change next year. Things will get closer to normal. When is this supposed to start up for you guys? We have one or two in January, one or two in February, you know, they just, they're all sprinkled out through it throughout the year, whenever they come in. All righty. So uh, I would like everybody to check out Greg's playing uh, with Restless Heart. Go to restlessheartband.com and uh, look for them if they're coming to your town. Also, uh, if you're interested in working with Greg and having him do some tracks for you, he's got a studio. You could reach him at go to restlessheartband.com or you could reach him at Greg with one G at restlessheartband.com. Just send him some links and some information, you know, what is the track you're interested in him working with? Why do you think he's a, you know, just give him enough information so he can make a, a answer you logically and have some sort of sense of what you're looking for. Um, man, is there anything else that, that, that I, we could promote for you guys or. Not that I, I think you've been very thorough, man. You're, you're great. I really enjoy your <laughs> uh, I, I tune in every once in a while to listen to this. I listened to a little Richard Bennett last night, man. My gosh, what a, what a monster that guy is. I, don't know. I can't be with Richard Bennett. 
honestly, man, he's probably the most successful side man I, I've had. I have his career. Oh, I know. What a resume, huh? And, and I, if I would have read everything, I would have been there 40, you know, 30, 40 minutes. Yeah. I mean, and he's totally off the radar. He's like quiet as a church man. You know, <laughs> He's, t you know, so mellow. But then the same thing with Glenn. I had Glenn Warfont, and I released his interview, and they both play together for Knopfler. And Glenn's the same. You don't, I don't, Richard at least has a website. I don't even think Glenn has a website. He's, he's a monster. Uh, it's, and two nice guys, just really humble. And, you know, but thank you, man. I appreciate it. It's easy talking to nice people like you. So thank you very thank much. You. I appreciate yeah. it. Uh, Hang on, let me wrap this up, and then uh, you and I will talk. Thanks for everything, Greg. I really appreciate it. And best of luck next year. I hope you do get to go out and play in a ton of tours, man. Ton, ton of shows. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels with your friends. We appreciate your support. Thanks very much to Greg Jennings. Again, check out uh, Restless Heart at restlessheartband.com. And if you're interested in working with Greg on some tracks and having him play on your records, go to Greg, G-R-E-G, -E at restlessheartband.com. And uh, man, most important, especially nowadays, remember that happiness really is a choice. So choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I am out. Thank you so much, brother. I appreciate it, Greg.